Without a fundamental change in business model, very few higher education institutions can flourish for the foreseeable future. A few will thrive, those with generous endowments, strong brand recognition, or high selectivity rates as examples. Others, like my own institution, will do well because they can demonstrate their effectiveness in changing the most lives at a reasonable cost. But most will limp along in an environment of decreased enrollment, increased competition, and higher costs, and increasing skepticism about the value of their product. Some will be overwhelmed by these forces and either be forced to close or will be absorbed by other institutions. Stay with me. Analogies are difficult because they eventually break down, but it seems to me that going to college is a bit like getting married. It's a long-term commitment for most people. There's no guarantee of success, and it's expensive. Strangely enough, the average cost of a wedding and the average cost of a year of college are nearly the same, $33,900 and $37,900 uh, respectively. Marriage requires commitment and devotion, and so does being a full-time student successfully. But there the analogy breaks down, because Americans' appetite for lavish weddings may be strong, but their appetite for expensive education is waning. Our changing world requires a change to higher education. The change that I'm referring to is a fundamental one, a change of mindset about how an education is acquired, a change that must apply to both institutions and consumers, individuals and their employers. The structure of higher education, once necessary, is now antiquated and will ultimately lead to its downfall. Originally, classes required in-person instruction, which required students to relocate the campus, which encouraged full-time status, because four years was already a long time to move somewhere else. Being a residential student meant that the cost of education now necessarily included more than just tuition, room, board, and other fees related to living expenses, courses became necessary, and American higher education was structured so that it was by necessity a massive undertaking for the student in terms of time, cost, and the necessity to relocate. Some of these required investments have lessened over time, of course. The rise of community colleges, the sheer number of higher education institutions in general, and the ever-growing online options have all made relocation less necessary. But other aspects of the commitment have only grown. With a gradual increase in the number of credit hours needed to graduate, only about half of students are able to finish undergraduate study in four years. The rising necessity for graduate degrees has also increased the total time commitment necessary. And the increase in tuition every year, which reliably outpaces inflation by a wide margin, has meant that the financial commitment has only increased. The result is that higher education is costing more, taking more time, saddling graduates with more debt, and just as importantly, does a poor job of meeting either the scheduling needs or the credentialing needs of students. Higher education is caught in a death spiral of higher costs, longer and longer time to degree achievement, and less and less satisfaction on the part of the consumer. A fixed cost structure, a traditional revenue model, the, requir the requirements of accreditors, and tradition all constrain institutions within the spiral and leave them seemingly unable to break free. Many schools claim to have a mission or a vision for the graduates in which they create lifelong learners, but they are really operating within a system that encourages just the opposite. Higher education is conceived of as brief, intense, and resource intensive, culminating with the acquisition of what is often a hyper-specialized, relatively inflexible credential. This is certainly not a process that most people could repeat many times during their entire lives. This is because the transaction between student and college is too big and too time-consuming in the short term without a guaranteed result in the long term, and thus the stakes are too high. If I purchase a car, I need supply only my own treasure, and after I do that, I know I will own a car. If I want to go to college, I must supply my time, talent, and treasure, and after I'm done doing that, my chances of walking away with a degree are around 50-50. Is it any surprise that prospective students are skeptical about whether they should participate in that transaction? 
Now, one of the assumptions that I'm going to make is that the solutions to higher education's challenges will not come from within. Higher education is a highly insulated business. People in education tend to stay in education, and people who work in other fields rarely enter education. Higher education is also a creature of tradition. This is a successful recipe for prestige and exclusivity, but not for innovation and diversity, and not for solving large systemic problems. If we think seriously about solving the challenges in higher education, we really have to look elsewhere. And there are truly intriguing solutions that have been implemented in other industries that appear not only to map quite well onto what ails higher ed, but also lend themselves well to the kind of sweeping cultural change that higher ed needs. There are industries that have been disrupted by innovation that were curiously effective. Uh, an excellent example is Uber. Uber preserved what people essentially needed, a way to get from point A to point B in a vehicle, and then systematically dismantled everything that people hated about the traditional taxi business. It's very interesting to talk to people about Uber. Very often, they remember their very first ride. The ability to see the progress of the car coming to get you, to know the name of your driver, to rate the driver afterwards, to remove cash from the transaction, etc. All of these things were complete departures from the traditional taxi business, which seemed designed to produce powerlessness and inconvenience on the part of the rider. Uber also created a completely new experience for the drivers. Financial and archaic credentialing barriers to entry were largely removed, and driver scheduling flexibility was created. As a result of its sweeping overhaul of the ride experience, Uber not only completely disrupted the taxi business, but has already spawned a host of imitators. Uber certainly isn't perfect, and I think that it's still figuring out a balance between the interests of riders, drivers, and the parent company itself. But there is no denying that its success has been meteoric, and that its success can be traced directly to addressing the needs and desires of the rider and driver. At this point, the analogy breaks down Students are not riders, drivers are not teachers, and Uber is not an accredited university. But hopefully the point is made, disruptive change came from the outside and was comprehensive. Perhaps a slightly closer analogy is Netflix. Netflix saw a cumbersome movie rental industry and an inconvenient commercial theater culture where people had to actually go somewhere and spend time with strangers to get something they wanted. That's been replaced with the convenience of renting and watching movies at home, and even more importantly, individual transactions have been replaced by a subscription fee that creates the feeling that the more you use the subscription, the more you save. At this point, the analogy breaks down again, but before it does, consider, wouldn't it be desirable to have people think that education was the kind of thing to be binged upon rather than purchased out of obligation slash fear slash societal pressure, and then only as sparingly as possible? It is deeply embedded in our culture that acquisition of academic credentials from an accredited institution requires a considerable investment of time, talent, and treasure. A shift in that culture would require colleges to predict revenue in different ways, to de-emphasize the residential student experience, and the investment from the student required from the, for that, to shift labor practices away from the current credit hour model in favor of a more granular approach to college credit, and to see the school's relationship to students as less time constrained than is the current practice. I'm going to suggest that the survival of much of American higher education requires a shift from the current transactional model to a recurring revenue model which combines subscriptions with bundling, now called a rundle. Let's take this model apart for a moment in it, into its two main components. First, the subscription. As Anne Guarini at Inc.com put it, quote, the reality is that you can make a lot of more money charging businesses monthly for your offerings rather than demanding one lump sum up front. In 2018, subscription sales accounted for 86% of Adobe's total revenue, heaving their earnings up 77% over a year previously. The subscription economy is booming and crushing businesses that forego adoption." End quote. 
The point in education, of course, isn't to make more money. It's to have more customers, more consumers of education. I've had guests in my podcast who have talked in ways that were suggestive of the move to a sort of subscription model. I love the way Joe Salustio of Claremont Lincoln University put it. It's going to be a long-term relationship that you have as a student with a university. It's going to have more ins and outs and less continuous uh, uh, lengths of time. The skills will be, will be um, uh, uh, n- not necessarily competency-based education, but I think the skills are going to be very clear on how you earn this skill, how you earn this credit. I think you're going to see credits uh, broken up into ones and twos and halves. I just think that, that the student is going to be paced through education at a different rate. So it's a lifelong learning model. Uh, we'll have non-credit, micro-credentials, uh, stackable credentials. I think the four-year, go-for-four-year model will be vastly different in the next 20 to 30 years. Subscriptions are then combined with bundling. Anyone with cable TV knows bundling. Bundling items together and selling them as a package is advantageous for a number of reasons. Customers buy more because they perceive a greater discount. I hope you're hearing students take more total classes because they see value in doing so. Second, you can add less popular products by adding them to the bundle. This allows schools to add features or classes that don't necessarily have to pay their own way. Third, you can introduce new products to customers by coupling them with bestsellers, an excellent tool in the toolbox for change-resistant academia. Weaving these two concepts, subscriptions and bundling together, the Rundle is born, a recurring revenue bundle. Rundle is a term coined by NYU business professor Scott Galloway, who believes that brands will build and partner with others to build these lucrative bundles by combining services and charging a recurring subscription. Small schools can form strategic partnerships to create these subscription bundles, and in doing so, better defend themselves against the larger schools. Larger schools can leverage the already large pool of students to build more reliable, predictable, recurring revenue streams. Higher education typically does not bundle. In fact, services are studiously separated. In most cases, the first credit hour costs the same as the fifth. Of course, Purchases are combined. Students simultaneously purchase credit hours of instruction, food, dorm space, etc. But this really just means that they are being purchased as a set and appear combined on a single itemized bill. The premise behind bundling is that there is either a real or perceived discount that is a result of additional purchasing, which higher education does not do in any substantial way. Following Galloway's lead, I'll call this teaching-based rundle a trundle. A trundle is simply the application of the rundle to education. Trundles have the following characteristics. Credit hours are replaced with something much smaller. Ideally, an education credit equal to one hour of instruction or one hour of work on the part of the student. The precise formulation really doesn't matter. Each new credit need only have specific outcomes and be standardized for accrediting financial aid and reporting purposes. The cost of an education credit should be indeterminate in most cases. Ideally, students will want to acquire more than one credit, and those credits will be trundled in such a way so that more credits equals lower cost per student. This is, I'm sorry, lower cost per credit. This is purposeful. The more you purchase of something, the cheaper its per unit cost should be. And we want students to purchase lots of units of education, not only because we want the purchase itself to happen, but because we want the education to happen. Other aspects of educational costs should be bundled as well. Residential life is the best example and is already typically bundled to some extent. Rare is the dorm that charges separately for heat and electricity. Once again, the core principle is to provide additional value. The default method for obtaining the trundle is through a subscription. Once a student subscribes, acquiring additional education should have no additional barriers to entry. Taking a year off from college? This should be completely irrelevant as long as the subscription is maintained, which allows students to restart their work and, of course, encourages school, aka brand, loyalty. 
Taking seven years to slowly finish a course of study while working? Also irrelevant. If we take lifelong learning seriously, we should not be thinking about length of time to degree as a measure of failure. We want people to learn as much and as often as they would like to. Under this structure, degrees would be less important than educational credits. Colleges may still offer degrees, but educational credits of this type offer a granularity that degrees don't. But doesn't a degree capture that an entire curriculum has been completed? Yes, it does, but there are two considerations here. First, employers use degrees to measure applicants because it is one of the few reliable sources of information about skill acquisition, assuming the degree comes from a legitimate institution. A degree means that the applicant isn't merely claiming to have a specific level of attainment. It means that a third party, a school, is vouching for that claim. And then a further party, the accreditor, is vouching for that school. But this system doesn't exist because employers want it. It exists because that's all there is. Baccalaureate degrees are actually the worst offenders because employers see two-year technical degrees or graduate level degrees as more reliable, indi reliable indicators of skill attainment. Uh, a 2014 study from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York found that only 27% of bachelor degree graduates work in a field related to their major, and more recent analyses have found similarly poor outcomes for majors that did not provide workplace-based practice. Second, if trundles were implemented, colleges would need to partner with employers to change the way employers hire people. This change would require a shift in culture on the part of employers who need to see credentialing as an ongoing process more than they currently do. Where appropriate, a new hire in a specific area should be considered appropriately credentialed for an entry-level position when they are enrolled in a long-term academic program related to their field, and satisfactory progress in that program should be sufficient to maintain their academic qualifications for the position. Such a change would dramatically increase the available pool for positions. This shouldn't be interpreted to mean that unqualified people should be placed in positions. Rather, the nature of what it means to be qualified and how a position is structured should reflect that professional development is truly ongoing. Such a change would also mean to have the added benefit of students learning more about their field in case they decide it's not for them. Just as Uber has lessened the upfront cost to become a taxi driver, this model reduces the upfront cost for entry into specific fields. This isn't a traditional apprenticeship. It's not, it, it is a partnership between the employer and the educator in which each agree to conceive of education as a longer process that makes more workers available and achieves more educationally in the end. Higher education must be the leader in this transformation, not only because its survival may depend on it, but because it's in the best position to lead. Resistance to this model would not come from the consumer. We know from dozens and even hundreds of other industries that this model is the preference of the consumer. By pricing for more granular elements, per student costs should decrease because students buy mostly only what they want, and more purchasing reduces costs further. Resistance to this model should not come from education. Trundling would produce even more cash flow and create greater brand loyalty. I say should not be resistant because the calling card of higher education is its culture of permanence and solidity, which makes change difficult. Resistance should not come from the fundraising arm of schools. More students mean more alumni, and more brand loyalty means less competition against other schools for the support of alumnus who attended multiple schools. In addition, by making education credit more granular, donor opportunities are increased. Previously, a donor of modest means who wanted to support education would have to be content with essentially pooling his or her money with others. But now that donor can donate a scholarship for a specific educational credit for a single person. Resistance should not come from accreditors. Schools should be accredited as before, with additional evaluation being given to more granular educational credits. Because these credits are so limited in both time and learning objectives, they should be easy to assess for accreditors and educators alike. 
This isn't about colleges making more money. While it's true that if done correctly, more revenue would be generated, and that revenue would arrive more predictably. Uh, but to think about it only in terms of the cash nexus is to erroneously believe that the problem of higher education is a revenue problem. Higher education has a host of problems, and the Trundle approach addresses as many of them as possible by creating a system that better addresses the educational needs of future students, expands the workforce pool for employers, and reconceives educational pricing in a way from which consumers, which is customers and employers, and schools all benefit. Thanks very much for being with me. I look forward to talking to you again in the future.